Good evening and welcome to Let's Talk with Lou. As usual, I'm excited about having guests this evening that are so involved in our community, folks that care about the things that we care about in Santa Cruz County. Uh, tonight, we have two wonderful guests, as usual, that are going to talk about some goals and some ambitions and some things that they have uh, and they want to bring forth and serve our community in a great way. I'd like to first of all start out with saying a couple of things. Um, we lost a, a great lady uh, and she was a, a big part of community TV and that was uh, Paula Pinsonall. Paula actually was the person that got me to start uh, hosting Let's Talk with Lou. She was a, um, a New Yorker, uh, she was from Brooklyn, New York, and she uh, was raised in, uh, uh, in New York and came to Santa Cruz in 1981. Uh, she was known to many uh, as to host community TV shows such as Let's Talk and then four years later, Let's Date. Always the entrepreneur, the original startup woman, she owned and operated Paula's Brooklyn Cafe coffee shop and the little old frame maker Paula's Bistro and co-owner of Great Stuff. She volunteered and she inspired many. Uh, she was innovative and she was generous. She was a cut to the chase kind of individual. I will miss Paula, she reminded me of my own mom uh, from uh, R Rochester, New York. I loved her dearly. Uh, she was survived by uh, Stephanie, her daughter, uh, grandchildren, Sarah and Adam, and great granddaughters, Luna and Rose. And if we could just take a, just a quick moment and just have some good thoughts for her and her family if we could. Well, thank you. This evening, uh, I am again pleased to be here uh, and be your host for Let's Talk <coughs> with Lou. Right from the get-go, I want to thank those that volunteer their time. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, Community TV. I want to thank Karen Scott. Uh, she is in the booth and she helps us. She's a volunteer. Uh, our director is Keith Gudger and audio is Gene Kratzker. Cameras, David Goldman. Uh, Jim Russo and Frank Turner. Without these volunteers, community TV could not happen. This is a live call-in show, and if the, you're looking for the number, it is uh, 831, of course, 425-8848, extension 630. And I have to say, the first time I get to say it, is hi to my grandson, because he's watching, Logan. Make sure to get to bed early and listen to Mom and Dad and Cameron. I love you guys. Um, tonight we have Greg Caput. He is uh, running for the Force District uh, and he has been a supervisor uh, for the last term and he has done an excellent job. Greg uh, brings a lot to the table uh, as a supervisor. Uh, he serves on, if I read all the stuff, we'd be here most of the night, but he serves on the following regional agencies and boards, the Advisory Council, Area Agency on Aging, Monterey Bay Government Board and Directors, Government Health Appeals Commission, Highway and Construction Authority, Santa Cruz County Medical, uh, Mental Health, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission, Workforce Investment Board, and the Juvenile Justic, uh, Justice uh, Council. And thank you for being here tonight, Greg. You're welcome. It's exciting, you're running a campaign, uh, and I'm sure you're working real hard at it, but we will get to that in a moment. I want to introduce my other guest this evening, and uh, she is running for a judgeship, uh, Saida Coliotti. 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 Uh, nice uh, Italian name. Yes. Okay. And uh, she's running for Superior Court Judge. Thank you for being here this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Saida currently works as a lead attorney at the Sixth District Court of Appeals. Uh, Saida graduated from UC Santa Cruz in 1991 from UC. Uh, Hastings School of Law in 1994. She's practiced civil and criminal law during 23 years as, as a lawyer in both the trial and appellate courts and she began her career practicing environmental law. She then clerked for California Supreme Court and after her clerkship, Saidia worked as a domestic violence agency for seven years. She ran her own practice right here in Santa Cruz and she has worked on local and criminal and civil cases and litigated appeals all over the state. Uh, also a professor at the Monterey College of Law. Uh, one thing I was really impressed with, and this is uh, definitely a feather in her cap, uh, is uh, when she was going to law school, uh, she was uh, on the Hastings Woman Law Journal, which is a very big accomplishment. So congratulations on all the things. If I read all your stuff, we would be here two hours. 
You've been <laughs> tremendous in the community, so thank you for all the volunteer work you've done. It's my pleasure. Greg, I want to start with you, and let's talk about uh, a few things. Uh, I want to talk about, first of all, uh, we've got a, a couple real important things, but first of all, how are you doing on the campaign? Let's talk a little bit about that, and um, what are some of your goals and ambitions uh, for being reelected uh, as our county supervisor? And we'll talk about particularly the Pajaro River, uh, public safety, uh, and probably a social safety net, and some of the hottest topics right now that are out there. Um, what would you guess are a couple of the hot ones that you uh, would like to make a significant change uh, and, uh, and change our environment? Uh, and certainly, um, you know, being, being a, a county supervisor, you have a lot, a lot of say in your district. You bet. <coughs> Thanks, Lou. And uh, one of the, the biggest project uh, that we're dealing with, uh, I, I tell people when they ask me, what does a supervisor do? And it's really from a pothole all the way to uh, the Pajaro River 100-year flood pr uh, protection plan, which is a $250 million project. Uh, what we did do uh, is uh, lower the, uh, we made it, we reduced uh, the risk of flooding in uh, the Pajaro uh, Valley area, uh, especially by the senior citizen uh, community. How, let me ask you this, you uh, Greg, if I can, how, how did that get accomplished? Because that is a, a, a pretty significant uh, feat uh, for somebody to do that kind of work. What, what did you do to get that accomplished? Right. Well, no, the, the, we didn't get the 100-year plan. We're working on that. And we're, we're as far along as uh, we have been in the last 25 years as far as paperwork. We have to deal with the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. We have to de uh, deal with the state of California. We deal with fish and uh, wildlife. Uh, and, uh, you know, different agencies have to sign off on it. And, uh, and then we have to look for funding. But what we did do is we removed 300,000 cubic yards of sediment from the Pajaro River about three years ago. Uh, that's 30,000 of those big uh, trucks. They call them belly loaders. 30,000? 30,000 30, huge okay. truck loads. Wow. Uh, that sediment, is, most of it is coming from uh, the San Benito uh, River. And uh, but th th we can't stop that, but we can remove it. And what that did is it reduced the risk, probably gave us a few years, maybe up to 10 to 12 years, where we could now make plans for the big one. Uh, because if we didn't do it about a year and a half, if you rem remember, we had the big storm, one of the biggest we've had in a long time. And the river was uh, at capacity. It was running right at the, uh, at the top. Uh, it was ready to go over. If we didn't remove the, the two years before that, if we didn't remove that sediment that was in there, uh, it would have gone over the top uh, probably. So what, what it does is it increases the flow of water by removing that sediment. Uh, in a big storm, 4,000 gallons per second in a storm is able to keep moving through that river rather than filling up and jumping over. And we made sure there were no obstructions, uh, bottlenecks that mm -hmm. would hold back water. Mm -hmm. And even after all that work we did, uh, we had a, uh, mer an emergency situation where it was kind of like the, uh, the boy with the, in the dike putting a hole, mm -hmm. put his thumb in the hole to keep it back. Uh, it was starting to break over on Riverside Road and uh, the levee was, and Thompson Road. And uh, we got a call and we, we, d we didn't have the funding for it, but we said, we've got to fix it. So we, we were able to call, it was a million dollars that it cost the county, but all the supervisors said, uh, go. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, f uh, we prevented that from breaking, because once it was starting to break, mm -hmm. what, you, know, you know how it is, it gets worse and worse. So I'm, I'm very um, pleased about how uh, the county worked on it and how we worked on it, and also the city of Watsonville. Wow. So that's just one example, but uh, we are dealing with uh, public safety and we're deal also with uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. And I can talk about maybe that a little bit later. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I would like to mention uh, what we've done in those areas too. Sure. Sure. I th what, what, uh, what I'd like to do uh, for sure is, uh, Greg, is talk about these things in uh, a couple more things in a little bit uh, of detail. And then at the end, uh, and if you can sum up uh, what you'd like to leave our listeners with for a couple of minutes 
Um, so first of all, and, and, and that's very impressive, uh, you know, that you were able to um, get the rest of our county supervisors uh, it, it to work uh, with you on the same page, so to speak, for a million dollars. Uh, that's an accomplishment. Uh, it, you obviously have the best interest of the district at hand, and you were able to get the thing that needed to be done. Um, as well as it sounds like you still got more work to do, uh, you're here to stay and you want to get that work accomplished, so it, yeah. uh, hats off to you for that. You bet. So and I, I will add, uh, and then we also voted on different areas in the county that had emergency situations, sure. and I voted along whatever we had to do, we had to do. Mm -hmm. There was $200 million worth of uh, storm damage in the, uh, 2017. Oh, $200 million. Wow. Um, where were you born? Where? You're Watsonville, right? Watsonville, California, yeah. There you I, go. I can tell you where I went to school. I can tell you the name uh, of every teacher I had all the way up through the seventh grade. You are local, <laughs> and I love that. Uh, it, it, I always wished I was. I, I've been here 40 years, but that, that local uh, presence makes a difference. Uh, you, you have a love, an obvious love for your community, uh, and you're showing it, uh, and you're committed. And we'll talk about a couple other things, too, about how you give very generously back to the community with your salary. Uh, with a lot of generous donations, and that that speaks tons. Uh, it really does to the kind of person you are. Um, I serve on a board with you, and uh, I am impressed by all the things that you bring to that board: uh, depth, a uh, caring, uh, a loving for your community. And, and it's obvious, it's just in, in the way that you do things, and you've got character. So I, I thank you for uh, uh, you know being here and talking about that. A lot of people don't have opportunity to say, you know, tell me about yourself, but this is the opportunity. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, if I'm going to do a little patting on your back. Maybe you don't get that too often, but uh, especially with a lot of kids at home. You know, it's the other way around, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Tell us a little about what, what would be your second uh, most important thing that you'd like to talk about tonight. Bahara River certainly is a big one because we're an ag community, especially in your district. But what would be the second most important thing that you'd like to talk about, Greg? Uh, it's tough because there's a lot of big <clears throat> issues, but uh, the one that is really important right now that it's uh, been fairly new in the last couple of years, uh, we're putting in a new mental health uh, facility in Watsonville. Uh, before, it was a little bit disjointed. Uh, somebody would have mental health issues, and they'd call, and they'd have to go to Emmeline Street in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's tough sometimes when you're talking about crisis intervention especially. So we're going to have a state-of-the-art uh, facility in Watsonville mm -hmm. uh, right down uh, in the center of uh, the Pajaro Valley there mm -hmm. and people will be able to go there. It will be staffed by a psychiatrist and psychologist mm -hmm. and also counselors and they will deal and they'll have outreach uh, workers uh, you know helping out uh, because the mental health is, um, it, it can be a, a very preventative thing for violence, but also uh, it, it also can save lives too if th somebody's you know considering suicide or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're also talking about homelessness, and there are a lot of homeless people that do uh, have mental uh, you know issues, especially veterans uh, mm -hmm. after they've been in the war or combat. Sure. And uh, we, we have outreach, outreach workers working with them, going out there and actually talking to them and trying to get them to come in. And to have it in Watsonville, and also they have it in Santa Cruz at Emmeline Street, mm -hmm. is a wonderful opportunity to actually you know, be able to help them out. So that, that's another thing too, a lot of issues. Now the Veterans Service Office in Watsonville, it used to only be open one day a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's open four days a week in Watsonville. And not only that, we finally staffed about three years ago uh, an outreach worker that goes and talks to hom homeless veterans. Mm. And we also, uh, uh, we have a lot of World War II veterans and they uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes can't get around. I mean, they're, they're up in age. They're like 93, 94 years yes. old, a yep. lot of them. Yep. So what we're doing is we're sending somebody to their home to mm -hmm. talk to them. They, they may have uh, uh, benefits that, have, that, that they've earned and have coming to them, but they haven't been able to go through the paperwork and you know, get it done. So we, we're, we're actually working really hard on that, and I'm proud of it. Along with the immigration, the immigration office in Watsonville is wonderful, mm -hmm. helping people have a pathway to uh, citizenship. You know, rather than, uh, I believe in building bridges rather than walls. And, uh, 
I think... Uh, Say that one again. I like that. Okay. Building bridges instead of walls. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> you know, and we want to do it legally, and we, we have uh, the immigration office right there in Watsonville, mm -hmm. and we, I make sure that they get funding that they need to stay in Watsonville, mm -hmm. because we are the center of the county of uh, immigration uh, problems, so to speak, as far as undocumented and documented. Uh, we're not. Uh, we are. We're making a pathway for them to go through the system mm -hmm. and try to, uh, you know, become become citizen. Wow. So um, that that sounds like a, a, a great task you've taken on, and it sounds like you're making a lot of progress. And it sounds like certainly you got some, you know, more work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, that, that's a, a commendable. Let's talk about, um, if we could, uh, uh, roads and bridges. Uh, certainly, you know, that's a big issue, uh, and not just the potholes, but, you know, how do we, uh, you know, what's on everybody's mind? Uh, what can we do about roads, and, and what, what have you done so far about that uh, in your district? Well, we've worked on the roads. Of course, we have a lot of damage from a year and a half ago, but <coughs> we have got a lot done. Uh, just the most recently, we got a bridge put in uh, on uh, Casserly Road, which is near... Um, uh, the Spring Hills Golf Course. Sure. So a lot of people know where that is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been, it was washed out for close to three years. Mm -hmm. It looked like it was going to be set uh, set back because it was going to cost a million and a half dollars to uh, fix it, and uh, that would have put it off until 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did is I talked to Public Works, and uh, they said they had a plan. Uh, they f for them to apply for a grant, we would have had to wait. And I said, let's try to push it through at a, at a lower cost. They came up with a great, a great idea. In order to f get by all the paperwork that you have to go through with the fish and game, of course, and uh, mm -hmm. the state of California and also the federal governments involved in any flow of water. Uh, so what uh, we did is uh, to speed up the paperwork and actually uh, get by all of the restrictions, we put the old bridge over, we put the new bridge right over the old bridge. Mm. So we didn't have to touch the actual water. Mm -hmm. we, we removed some obstructions, you know, that were there. Uh, but if you, if you go out there and you look at it, the new bridge is right over the top of the old bridge. And of course it has steel girders and all that. But uh, the water is flowing fine. The federal government said it's okay. The state government, Fish and Game said it was okay. And it was completed last summer. Wow. So uh, it was about two years ahead of schedule. Uh, we, uh, we put in uh, at, uh, schools, safe routes to schools, which is uh, a big, uh, big problem, and we've been dealing with that. We, had a, a, we put in a crosswalk, uh, pedestrian activated pro crosswalk over on Highway 152 and College and Houlihan Road, mm -hmm. and we are going to do, it's on the work list now, uh, we're going to redo that whole intersection. That'll probably be in about a year. So all of these things cost money, and we've. Uh, it, it's kind of funny too. You do one thing, and then somebody else complains. Uh, we we had a washout on one road. I won't mention the road, but anyway, uh, w we made sure we got it done. Uh, it had to be done before October 15th. Otherwise, time would have run out. They won't do a project uh, dealing with water bef when the winter is sure. uh, ready to start. Yeah. So we got it all done. Uh, we did all the paperwork, uh, fish and game, and of course, all the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we opened up the road. Mm -hmm. And so now the only complaints I get is people said they liked it better before because uh, they didn't have tra traffic uh, going by their house. Mm -hmm. uh, before it was a dead end because of the washed out road, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, it's open and it's a, it's, it's a real important connector route uh, between east and west uh, Pajaro Valley. What I'm getting, um, especially from the, the bridge project, that, that that was an innovative, uh, a unique way to get it done quickly and effectively and, uh, and, and probably save the tax dollars some money? Uh, actually, I'm glad you asked me that. We saved $1 million. Oh. It was supposed to be $1.5 million. Yeah. We spent uh, half a million dollars That's on amazing. It. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, that is a, a very uh, uh, innovative way to save the tax dollars that uh, we all, you know, want to know where they're going, and uh, and then to hear that you're actually doing it, then I'm not sure that uh, any other format would give you that opportunity to to talk about that, and that's that's significant. So. Sure.
And it just, again, it kind of renders back to my original thought about you. You know, you're really there for, uh, for all of us in, in, in a mighty way. So that's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And lastly, I'll just say we hired seven more uh, sh deputy sheriffs yeah. to be patrolling uh, the uh, unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County. Yeah. Okay. yeah they were under, understaffed. Wow. Wow. Well, let's do one more, um, and uh, and let's do uh, we do a little quicker because uh, interesting enough, the timing just I mean, time goes by in this. I, I want to leave time for the judge too. Yes, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, She's going to have time. Yeah, we got okay, we're there. Let me give you another couple minutes, and then at the end you get to kind of you know whatever, however you want to sum up again as as I mentioned earlier just to leave uh, our listeners with uh, some thoughts about uh, when they go to the polls, too, uh, what's important uh, and what they should be thinking about, for sure. But uh, let's talk about one other thing. Um, you, get a, you get a pick on this, either social safety net or public safety. What would you like to talk about the last couple of minutes? Well, we can talk about, hmm, well, they're both important. But anyway, it, it's been an honor and privilege to serve the people of the Pajaro Valley, South County. and. Uh, I tell people that uh, uh, I'll either win the election or lose the election because people know how I stand. Mm -hmm. So I'm at peace with that because people, yeah. a lot of people do know uh, what, what I stand on and uh, mm -hmm. you know how I speak out. And um, it's important that they know that and they can either vote for me or against me on that mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they do know me. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, public safety is really, of course, uh, at the top of any list. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were understaffed, undermanned uh, uh, for uh, about four years, especially during the recession with the uh, deputy sheriffs. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there, there were ride. I went on a couple of ride-alongs. Once, uh, at one time, some one deputy called in sick, mm -hmm. and they they were understaffed. This is about four years ago, and they only had one deputy sheriff uh, patrolling all the way from uh, the uh, La Selva Beach covering all the Watts, the Wattsville unincorporated area, mm -hmm. all the way to Mount Madonna and Aromas. Wow. That's huge. Uh, and if you get a call in one, you're patrolling one area, then you get a call in the other. We're talking about a long wait. But uh, they do uh, they do have a, uh, a cooperative uh, agreement with Wattsville PD mm -hmm. and, and everything like that. But also, the uh, uh, sh they were understaffed. So, uh, we found it in the budget to make sure that that was a priority, all of the supervisors, and uh, they're funded, and we, we hired seven more. And that means that if somebody calls in sick, we're going to have at least two patrolling in each, uh, you know, each district. Wow. So that's, that's really important. And then, um, last but not least, in terms of what a county supervisor does, um, and, and what uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I know county supervisors do a lot of land use. Um, they certainly are like mayors in the unincorporated areas uh, of cities and municipalities, and they're kind of on the outskirts. Um, but you do you make a lot of big decisions. Uh, and um, could you talk a little bit about just in general? Uh, and we do have a, a couple of minutes for you about what uh, supervisors do to the commoner. What would they understand about your job? You bet. Uh, we're, we're dealing all the time. It's a very, it's very uh, legislative uh, type of job, meaning that we actually do pass laws and we'll uh, uh, revise old laws. Uh, we've made it a lot easier uh, uh, for people to, if they want to renovate their home, uh, before they would have to do all kinds of paperwork through the planning department. Mm -hmm. Now if your renovation is 50% of the house or less, it goes in and into the fast track. Uh, they don't have to do all the paperwork. Mm -hmm. If it's over 50 percent, yeah, then they have to, uh, you know, show if uh, they're making it bigger, are they adding this and that. But uh, we've made it a lot easier for people to go to the uh, planning department. But the other is uh, restrictions, the old restrictions we had on ag land uh, in the past. We've uh, we've made it now where people, uh, people that own the, their home and they live on the farm, uh, they can have a farm stay or they can have a bed and breakfast and have somebody stay in their home without having to go through all kinds of paperwork and you know the, they'll have to pay a tax uh, it's called a TOT tax mm -hmm. but uh, so we, we've, we're allowing that before we didn't and then we're also allowing uh, people to have fruit stands uh, on their own farm mm 
mm-hmm. as long as they're selling their own products or their neighbors' products. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not turning it into a big market. Mm-hmm. But uh, before they couldn't do that. Uh, the other one uh, that's uh, really important too is the. Uh, uh, before there was a restriction when they were they needed uh, workers to go out in the field, mm-hmm. uh, they cu- they couldn't even put up a sign that says we need workers call this number. Mm-hmm. So we, we you know we well, obviously we, uh, we changed that. So uh, we've made it a lot uh, a lot more friendly for people to go and you know get things done. So. Excellent, good. Sounds like um, you've got a, a wonderful handle on what the needs are of Pajaro Valley uh, in your district, and you've accomplished many things, and it sounds like you've got some goals and some ambitions to continue on in that vein, and uh, I am hopeful uh, that you are successful uh, in your campaigning, and I know uh, you uh, knock on a lot of doors, and uh, I, I talk to a lot of people personally that know you and, and like you, so um, I, th- I think uh, you're definitely the right man for the job. So. Thank you for the service you've give, given to us up to this point. And we will come back to you to Larry, the last part of the hour, and we'll talk a little bit more. So, okay. Uh, and I will talk uh, now. Uh, I'd like to, we talked uh, uh, already in the beginning uh, with Saida uh, Coliotti. <laughs> Coliotti. <Hi>. Coliotti. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. I'm going to get that right. And uh, let's talk about a, a, a few things with uh, your um, your ambitions and what you would like to accomplish. And I guess a lot of people don't know uh, necessarily uh, I, I, unless you've been in the system, but they don't know what judges do um, and how you might make a difference. Um, and uh, I guess maybe talk, uh, start out with what brought you to this decision? Because many times, uh, as successful as you've been in your practice, to come over to a judgeship is a very different world. Uh, you bring a lot of experience uh, and a lot of depth, and, and, uh, and you went to UCSC, so you're local, and you've done all kinds of good things. But let's talk about that if we could. Yeah, well, actually, it won't be a huge change for me because I've spent a lot of my career in the judicial system already. And it's one of the first things I did, as you mentioned earlier, was a clerkship at the California Supreme Court. Okay. And even way back then, it felt like that was the place for me, was in the judicial system. Okay. I really like seeing things from both sides, considering arguments, and reaching a fair decision. Mm-hmm. So um, currently, as you know, I work at the Court of Appeal, and I'm helping the justices there make decisions. So I'm already really doing the job of a judge. Okay. In addition, for the last three years or so, I've already been substituting in as a judge at the Superior Court. It's called being a judge pro tem, or technically a judge pro tempore. Mm-hmm. And I sit and run a courtroom um, when a judge you know, needs to take a vacation or is sick or has a meeting or something. So it's not going to be a huge transition for me. Huh? And I know that I already enjoy it, and I know I'm good at it. And the, the reason I know I'm good at it is because the clerks in the courtroom, I always ask for their feedback after I've presided over a calendar and say, you know, how did I do? Because they're the experts. Yeah, you know, and the comments I get are things like, you treated people fairly. Yeah. You explained things in a way that people could understand. Yeah. And that's what I think people want in a judge. Is that uh, similar to an administrative judge, uh, the thing you're doing now? or, or No, an administrative law judge is different. It wouldn't be in superior court. Okay. Um, superior court here, there is criminal, there are criminal departments, there's mm-hmm. civil departments. That's mm-hmm. where you'd go if you had maybe a property dispute, if you had employment law, if you had an environmental law issue, or if you had a personal injury case, you'd go into the civil departments. Mm-hmm. There's two family do- law departments that deal with child custody, divorce, domestic violence. There's two different juvenile departments, one for dependency, which is like the child protective services cases, and one for juvenile delinquency. So really a Superior Court judge here in Santa Cruz County in particular needs to be someone who can sit in any of those departments and know the law in family, in civil, in Mm -hmm. criminal, in juvenile. And in my 23-year career, luckily I've practiced in all of those. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to sit and take the bench and serve the community in whichever department needs me the most. And you've been doing that already uh, in the capacity that you've been doing it. Uh, so this is, uh, it's a, it's a, it sounds like it's going to be a really easy transition uh, if you're elected to that position. Let's talk about that for a moment if we can. Um, there are some judges, I don't know what uh, how that happens. Uh, I don't remember <laughs> that class from a long time ago. But th- sometimes they get appointed and then sometimes they have to run for a, a, a position and actually go out and get you know a, a, a folks to vote for them. Um, what, is, there, uh, is there a difference in, in, in how you get appointed, or, or what, how does that occur? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we haven't had a judicial election in this county in eight years. Yeah. So the way it works is once you become a judge, you have a six-year term. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So my term would start in January 2019 and I'd have a six year term. If I was to retire or leave for some reason at the end of a six year term, then it would go to election again. But what happens most of the time is judges retire or leave in the middle of their six year terms. Ah. And in that case, the opening becomes an appointment by the governor. I see. So, and the other thing that often happens is people don't want to run against a sitting judge typically. So most judges, at, if they want to stay on the bench after their six year term, they file their papers and nobody else files against them. So what's happening now is that mm -hmm. a judge is retiring mm -hmm. and there is going to be an open seat mm -hmm. and that's why I've put in my papers to run okay. with the you know, strong support of many people in the legal community who urged me to do it. Could we talk, uh, are you okay with talking about a couple, a few of your endorsements? When I looked at your list, uh, it was impressive. I, I, Thank you. I, I don't think I saw anybody not on that list endorsing you that you know are th uh, that are significant in the community. Uh, many of our judges, many of our electeds, uh, our some of our county super. If you can talk about that and how does that work? I mean, how do um, how did you get so much recognition uh, uh, for for doing all the things you've done? Obviously, you've got it. Uh, you've got you're on the right track. Um, I'd be very surprised if you don't get uh, you know elected to that position. But you got such momentum going. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's like anything. The more community involvement you've shown in, in your career, mm -hmm. the more support you're going to have. And so for many years, <coughs> I've just, I've really dedicated all my free time to working in this community. Things like coaching in the high school mock trial program, ah. being a scoring attorney for the high school mock trial program. I've worked with two different high schools in that mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. I worked with two different elementary schools elementary schools in the elementary law program, which mm -hmm. is where attorneys get paired up with fifth graders to go into a classroom, teach the kids about the criminal justice system, and then take them to a courthouse for a field trip where they get to actually put on a little mock trial in the courtroom. One of the kids gets to be the judge, yeah. kids get to be attorneys yeah. and witnesses, yeah. and the kids yeah. who get to be jurors. Oh, yeah. I always tell them they have got the most important job of all. Yeah. They get to make the decision, and so they love that. So those are just a few things that I've done for years and years, and you know, I've just been involved in a lot of things. I mean, I certainly, you know, wasn't born with a silver spoon. I didn't have these connections naturally. They're really yeah. all from what I've done in my career. That also includes being a leader in the legal community. I was president of Women Lawyers of Santa Cruz County mm -hmm. and served on the board of Women Lawyers of Santa Cruz County for mm -hmm. many years. And I've just, you know, always taken the time to be as involved in as many events as I can. In fact. Before I came here tonight, I was at the Santa Cruz County Trial Lawyers um, annual elbow rub where they give an award and they're giving a service award this right. year to Stephen Michelle LaBerge, very deserving people and mm -hmm. great, great community members as well. Yeah. So the community involvement uh, certainly says a lot about who you are uh, in terms of doing all the, uh, all the volunteer work. I looked at a few things uh, and it, it was very impressive. Um, I'll read a couple of them. But I <laughs> like the mock trial. Uh, community TV, actually, we had a camera in Judge Maragonda's um, uh, courtroom, and it, I guess it goes back now maybe three years, and that was exciting uh, when Bob Lee was uh, the, the district attorney, uh, and we got to I interview each of their, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, several of the, uh, the folks that were leading that. And I think he did Sa the city of Santa Cruz, or Santa Cruz High School at the time, uh, and it seemed like their, their stuff had such depth, and it seemed like that, that's our future attorneys, for sure. Uh, it's our future leaders, and that's what makes me so excited to work with these kids. Because you start with kids who yeah. don't know much about the law, they're not necessarily the greatest public speakers, and throughout yeah. working with them for months in mock trial, they learn to find their voices, right. they learn about the justice system, and by the end, yeah, they're future budding lawyers and, and leaders of our community, and yeah. it's really a pleasure to work with them. Yeah, and to be able to develop that in young people uh, and then find out <laughs> later that they've done some really good things with their life, I'm sure that's going to be very fulfilling. It is, and it's another reason I've taught for 12 years at Monterey College of Law and have helped many young people become lawyers. And, you know, it's just always the most proud moment when my former students become my colleagues. And there yeah. are, there's many, many of them out there in our legal community. Monterey College of Law is a fantastic community mm -hmm. law school mm -hmm. and many of the people who graduate come back and serve here as lawyers providing legal services for people in our community. And that's another reason I have such strong support from the legal community. You know, they've seen mm -hmm. me teach and they've seen the work I've done as a lawyer. And you know, a lot of the lawyers in our community have come to me over the years for help with their cases. They know they're gonna get mm -hmm. someone who's gonna work hard, who's gonna reach the right answer, and help them win their cases. Monterey School of Law, uh, College of Law, um, very impressive. Um, I, I think it's one of uh, uh, Monterey Bay's jewel 
uh, and, and, and Jules, and uh, it, they have one of the highest, oh, I shouldn't tell you, you probably know, but they have one of the highest uh, 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 rate of, of passage for the bar uh, uh, when the kids go and take the bar exam. Uh, and uh, some of the bigger schools uh, can't compete with that hardly. Uh, and could we talk a little bit about the success of the school? Because you're obviously a part of a successful uh, law school. Many of our lawyers here uh, uh, locally uh, have gone to Monterey School of Law. Lawyers Many and of, judges. Yeah, judges as well. Many of them, I guess, yeah. just because of proximity, uh, certainly Santa Clara yeah. and, uh, and um, probably San Francisco, but in Stanford, but predominantly there's a, just a ton of them. Um, let's talk about the success of Monterey College of Law because you're part of that and obviously uh, you are making successful people uh, not only in our youth but uh, in those folks that are out there uh, and doing the kinds of things that attorneys do uh, and especially when they come on and they go on to uh, be legislators and, and you know uh, many of the times uh, our local um, congressmen and senators and uh, have gone to law school so it seems like a training ground for some of our world leaders and certainly our state leaders but what's going on at the school if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Before I get to that, I just want to mention, because you said that many of the former students become our leaders in the legislature, and actually two of my former students are not just colleagues of mine in the legal profession, but they're actually colleagues in this campaign season. One of my former students is running for assembly, and one is running for board of supervisors in Monterey County. So just a kick to you know, be out there yeah. on the campaign trail and, and run into former students who are doing the same thing. Nice. Um, but in terms of what Monterey College is doing, I mean, it's a real, it is a really special school for many reasons, one of which is that all the professors are local judges and attorneys. So students start out with that immediate access mm -hmm. to learning how to practice and mm -hmm. being a part of this legal community. Mm -hmm. They're working directly with actual practicing lawyers instead of just law professors. And mm -hmm. I think that really helps them jumpstart their career. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and because it's a small school, there is a lot of attention paid on helping them, helping the students pass the bar. And from what I understand, one of the reasons that the bar rate has been successful in the past couple of years is because of the writing program. And I'm the director of the legal writing program down at Well, we got to stop there. on that one. Yeah. You're the director <laughs> of the writing program, and that is, uh, my, my son is a lawyer, uh, and you have to do a ton of writing uh, when you take the, the bar exam. Uh, and then in certainly in law school, so it is, it's huge. It's huge. As a okay. lawyer too, I mean, you're going to win your case yeah. most of the time based on what you've written, not based on what you're going to say in court. Sure. You know, in most any kind of motion work, it's the way you've written it, have you researched it, have you written it persuasively. So yeah, I'm really proud of the students because, the, yeah, the bar exam, it used to be three days, two of which were writing and one of which was a multiple choice. Now it's down to two days, but it's still a whole day of writing. And I know that the class that I teach and the people that I've recruited to be part of the writing program yeah. have really helped make that pass rate there get higher and as a result we've got some great attorneys in our community. Wow, wow. Do you know, I, I hate to put you on the spot, do you know, <laughs> I shouldn't do that, <laughs> but do you know what the, uh, the passage rate is like huge? I remember the last time I looked at it, it was like uh, it was like 60% higher than all the rest of most of the schools in California, some huge amount. Well I'm not sure about that. I know we just had I believe six or seven students pass out of a, you know, maybe 10 or 12 who took the exam and that's a, it is a high percentage. This last February was the last bar exam administered and only 29 percent of takers across the state passed. Okay. So yeah, to have anything over 29 percent is an excellent feat. Okay. So I don't know exactly what the percentage was though. Yeah, and, and the last time I looked at it was a long time ago too, so <laughs> I, I shouldn't have put you on the spot on that, but you, you had the answer. So. That's okay. Um, it's just always my pleasure to see those former students of mine on that yeah, pass list. It's yeah. great. Um, what kind of cases would you preside over uh, if you were elected? Uh, would you guess, and, and do you have any, this is a fun, fun question, do you have any things that you kind of enjoy? I mean, you probably do it all, do it all well, so it's hard to you know, articulate which one you enjoy the most, uh, yeah. but do you have one of those? Yeah, I mean, I'm really, like I said, I'm really excited to serve in any capacity that the court needs me to serve in, right. but typically new judges do start in misdemeanor criminal. Right and that's just a heavy caseload and luckily in my pro teming when I do the substitute judging I do a lot of sitting in traffic court traffic and minor violation court which is similar to misdemeanor court so I already have the experience of going through a busy arraignment calendar of conducting you know a bunch of trials and um, I think I'll be just fine when they put me in misdemeanors and, and then hopefully I'd really like to move on to maybe family law dependency court I think it's really important in those courts to have someone who um, has really a really kind and compassionate heart. Sure. I think it's really difficult for anybody going through 
any kind of family law or, or dependency case where you're at risk of losing your kids. Wow. And you know, those are really, really difficult cases. Sure. Um, there's a lot of competing interests. You've got to look at best interests of the children. Yeah. And you've also got to have some compassion for what the parents are going through. So I'm, I'm interested in you know, rising to that challenge. And actually, I'm already going through training to sit pro tem in the child support court. So I should be able to start doing that before I even take the bench. Wow. OK. So you've kind of been there, done that. It looks like you're, uh, it sure, sure seems up like you're, you're being lined up for what you've already been doing. You've got a love for it. Um, you got the experience. Um, you just bring a, a lot to the table, so yeah, good stuff. Thank um, you. What do you think your most important qualities uh, uh, would be of a superior court judge um, in terms of if you were just to look at uh, some other judge, let's say if you were going to, mm -hmm. you know, vote for them, what would you be looking for? Yeah. Uh, and then let's mirror that. I think with what you bring to the table. Yeah. And this is a kind of a setup question because I know you've already got all those qualities. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you get the same during the camera. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's what's been wonderful for me is that I've worked for a judge for 13 years of my career who is the embodiment of the kind of judge that everybody wants. She's even been recognized as judge of the year throughout the state. Um, she is someone who cares about every single person in a case, cares about the victims, she cares about the defendants, she cares about the attorneys. She cares about the other judges, and she cares about everybody in the court. You know, in our court, mm -hmm. she's the one that stops and makes sure she knows everybody's birthday and mm -hmm. what's going on in everybody's life. And so really, I think, you know, when you're the judge, you're the leader. And to show that kind of kindness and compassion to everybody and to take every case seriously and care about everybody in the case. And part of that caring is knowing the law. She knows the law. She makes sure that we get the law right in every case we work on. She's very fastidious that way. There's no shooting from the hip. That's mm -hmm. the biggest complaint I hear when people talk about judges that they had a bad experience with, that judge seemed to shoot from the hip. Um, you know, what do, what the do you mean by that? This is making a decision that's not based on the law, that's just based on maybe you know, how that, what the emotion is at the time and how okay. someone feels. Okay. Um, and so really for me, the, you know, the qualities of a great judge are listening to people, explaining the law in a way that people understand. Sure and reaching a ruling that's fair and that's based in the law because the overarching goal that I have mm -hmm. is to restore public trust and confidence in our judicial system. Mm -hmm. I think we have a, a loss of that to some extent here in this community and I think a really excellent judge who listens, who explains things clearly and who mm -hmm. reaches fair decisions that are with a knowledge of the law is gonna help restore that public trust and confidence. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the election for a judge. I know we talked about it a little bit more uh, earlier, um, but uh, when, when somebody goes to the polls, the kinds of things, what would they should be looking for at um, why they should elect somebody as opposed to somebody else? Um, what would you, could you summarize, let's say, I don't know, three characteristics of what the average layperson with no training in law uh, if, if they were standing in your courtroom, would want. Uh, you've talked about it a little bit, yeah. but let's, let's, let's think about what somebody might think of when they're at the polls, because that's what they're going to be doing next week. They're yeah. going to be voting for somebody, uh, and hopefully for you to, uh, to say, okay, uh, this is what I'm looking for. That individual's got it. And there's, uh, there's good people out there, for sure. But what distinguishes yeah. you, and you've talked about a lot of stuff from your opponent? Yeah, well, I have 23 years of experience, and people should really look at experience when they look at judges. Mm -hmm. And again, it's they need, you know, somebody who's going to be able to take the bench in any department mm -hmm. and know that law and make the fair ruling that's based in the law. Mm -hmm. So that's what I really bring is the experience of already working in the judicial system, of already being able to decide cases fairly, of having many, many years of in-depth decisions mm -hmm. that are based in the law and you know, I have done advocacy as well um, for well, many well, years. Let's talk, what, what's advocacy? Yeah, so advocacy is, um, you know, litigating cases, going to court and arguing for one side or the other. Oh, so okay. I've, all, I've also okay. done that. I've, like you said at the beginning, I've litigated okay. cases actually okay. statewide, okay. not just in Santa Cruz County, which is another part of my experience that I like to highlight because, you know, it's always good to have new perspectives on things and to see how things are done in other places as well. So, you know, if I was a voter going to the poll, I'd want to vote for the most experienced candidate, mm -hmm. the person that's been endorsed by 
the most judges and lawyers. You know, I won the Santa Cruz County Bar Association did a what's called a plebiscite where the attorneys voted for who they would support and I won that by over 20 percentage points and those are the people that really know what makes a good judge. So if I was a voter I'd want to know, you know, who do the lawyers trust to be the judge and that's me. So the judges and the lawyers out there actually uh, have already kind of put forth their best, best foot in, 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 in recognizing what you've done, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, that's impressive. So uh, although uh, the average person is going to go to the polls, um, the decision in, in a real way has been made for the people that really are in the know. It's, that's what it sounds like you're saying, uh, because those people are actually doing it day in and day out, and they're going, okay, that's a, that's a good, that's a good, they've, they've kind of characterized you as being a good judge, and those are judges and lawyers and people that are in the industry already, in your profession. Yeah, I mean, obviously every voter should make their own independent decision, and, yeah. you know, they should go to my website and read about me and read my endorsements and make their own decision. You know, I'm certainly not advocating that anyone should vote for me just based on, you know, one particular group's endorsement. But I do think it's significant. And sure. for someone who's considering what to do, I think, it, you know, if it was me, I would definitely want to know who do the lawyers trust, who the lawyers think is the smartest, most well-prepared, ethical, mm -hmm. fair judge. I know for me as a, uh, again, an, I don't have any law, law background, but as an average person, um, I think that weighs very heavily in a positive fashion that the judges and the lawyers and the people that are in your industry have already looked at you and said that's that's a person that you can you can count on to do a good job I, I would I would have a harder time I mean uh, you've got all the qualifications I see pages and pages of good things but you know what makes a good judge well you've, you've got it people that are that know uh, uh, what makes makes a good judge have uh, in many ways uh, 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 you know endorse you and, and put it put you know put their name behind your name uh, and saying yeah can you name are you uh, able to name a few of the people um, of endorsements? Well, I just like to say, you know, I have endorsements from really across the board from so many different places. I have, um, you know, every person on the Santa Cruz City Council. Okay. Many of our supervisors. So you got electeds? <laughs> electeds. Um, some of the groups that have endorsed me include the Sierra Club because yeah. I have that environmental law experience. Yes. The some of the unions have endorsed me. Yeah. Um, some of the Democratic clubs. I also have support from some Republicans, though. You know, I think I like to say that really everybody should want the same thing in a judge. It's not a, a partisan position. Everybody should want somebody who's smart, who's um, experienced, and who's going to be fair. Um, but yeah, I've got our state senator, our two state assembly people, all the mayors of the cities, um, and just numerous individuals. And um, I'm just very proud to have earned the support of so many people. And really, I'm here because a lot of people urged me to run. It wasn't necessarily my idea. It was a lot okay. of lawyers coming up to me and saying, yeah. you know, we want you to run. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I, I like to hear that. Um, I like to hear other people uh, that have, you know, looked at you and said, yeah, uh, they're, they're kind of tooting your horn, which is good. That's the way to do it. So um, I wish you a lot of luck in the uh, in the campaign, uh, and I think you've done a lot of the work already. But certainly on election day, um, we've got actually, believe it or not, we've got ten minutes left, and it goes by uh, like that. Uh, what I wanted to do in the last um, uh, few minutes is is give each of you an opportunity to summarize, and and then leave uh, you, our listening audience with something that they can again take to the polls. Uh, and if you can summarize in, in about maybe three minutes or so, and Greg, if we can come back to you. Uh, and then uh, if you can tell us a little bit about, um, in your mind, when they go to check the mark, you know, for who they're going to vote for, what should they be thinking about? <coughs> well, what I, what I worry about <coughs> and what I would like to see in the future, that my kids and grandkids would be able to recognize the beautiful uh, county that we live in. And uh, we, we are stewards of... Uh, a wonderful place, a wonderful environment, and I, I want them to be able to actually recognize what we have in the future. Mm -hmm. So that we're we're talking about a lot of things, uh, uh, the way we live, and of mm -hmm. course uh, how services are provided, but also uh, the environment that we protect, what we what we have that mm -hmm. makes it so wonderful to live here. And I think the biggest crisis right now going on is. We have, um, we have a, a very large uh, uh, part of society that's lo uh, earning very low wages, and then we have others that are earning a lot. 
We, we have to protect that middle class. Okay. We have to have a middle class in Santa Cruz County. So that's what so you bring to the table in terms yeah. of, okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, okay. something that's very, very important. Yeah. But also, we do have to protect the, uh, the ag land that we have, especially mm -hmm. it's some of the richest soil in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Uh, prime ag land. We can we can take uh, take an acre. What does it cost to rent an acre if you wanted to grow strawberries here? Mm -hmm. uh, about twenty eight hundred dollars an, an acre, mm -hmm. two thousand eight hundred dollars. You go uh, into other areas. Uh, you can rent an acre uh, for five hundred dollars or less, four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. It's because of the soil. It's because of the the weather that we have and all that. So whenever we're talking about building, and I'm a big proponent of affordable housing, mm -hmm. and we put in uh, for the first seven years that uh, I was uh, I've been on the board, uh, the great majority of all the affordable housing is down in South County, mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of the county is coming along too. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, uh, we have to be very protective of where we put it. We don't want to cover up the egg land. We have to protect that. Sure. And any time you add population, uh, we have to have schools for the kids that might be, uh, you know, attending. Right now, the elementary schools in uh, the Watsonville area, South County, are full. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about that. We have to think about public safety. Are we going to have enough fire and police uh, protection? Uh, Cal Fire, a, a big proponent of making sure that they get uh, uh, their funding from uh, the county and also from the state of California, uh, that they're, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're going into an area when we have, uh, you know, a forest fire, they're risk risking their lives. So, and the other is, uh, if, if we're talking about, every now and then somebody will say, oh, we're gonna build uh, like uh, 2,000 or 3,000 homes out in a certain area, and I'm talking about the Buena Vista area in South County, mm -hmm. and uh, that that would change that whole environment out there, and I'm, I'm not for all of that. I, I, w I would like to see some homes, but certainly not that many, mm -hmm. and also it would have a great impact on our regional airport. I'm a big proponent of making sure that our airport uh, is able to stay and function uh, in uh, it's the only airport left in Santa Cruz County. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that the uh, safety runways are not obstructed by, uh, you know, uh, building and, uh, and everything else that would end up uh, maybe making the airport end up uh, having to close. So uh, what I'm getting at is everything that we plan out, we have to think that it has a, another effect somewhere else. Uh, the traffic, of course, on the roads, mm -hmm. uh, they say that about uh, most most cars, uh, most families have two cars. I think a lot of families have more than that. But anyway, on average, two cars. Each car goes about 11 miles a day uh, per household. That's 22 miles of traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, multiply that by, let's say, you put in, uh, like I mentioned, uh, 2,000 homes in an area that I don't think should have that many homes. Uh, what is what is the math on that? It's astronomical and. Uh, how many miles a day we're adding to traffic and on the roads, and how many uh, actual miles in traffic we're adding in a year. So, we, uh, and who's middle class? Probably uh, your teacher's uh, salary, your starting fire and police mm -hmm. salaries. Okay. So, Good. Uh, we, we, we have to make it affordable for everybody. Good, good. Thank you for that, Greg. Um, I do want to remind our uh, listeners, this is a live call-in show, so 425-8848, uh, extension 630. Uh, we're down to the last, but uh, we do have a, a little bit more time, and this show's for you. Uh, Saida, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you would like our listeners, and especially our voters, when they go to the polls, to think about when they're voting for a judge. Well, I like to say, you know, we need judges who get it. I think that's what people really are looking for. And, you know, I'm someone who's raised my kids here. I have two teenage kids who are supporting me in this campaign, which is, I'm so proud of. It's two really teenagers wonderful. Are two teenagers. <laughs> they're awesome. You still got um, your wits about you. <laughs> oh, they're great. And, you know, and I do get it because actually my first courtroom experience was when I was 10 years old and I had to go to court and my parents were in a contentious divorce. 
and I actually had to stand in front of a judge and say oh, which parent I wanted to live with. Yeah. And I bring that to me when I sit on the bench and I think about how a lot of people feel when they're in court and they, the things they want. They want the judge to listen to them. Sure. They want the judge to explain things to them clearly, mm -hmm. just like I did when I was 10 years old. And they want the judge to make the right decision, the decision that's right for them, mm -hmm. right for their family, right for the community. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I'm committed to doing as a judge, that I'm already doing when I serve as a judge pro tem, and that I think the voters want. I think they want vo judges who listen, who get it, who can explain things clearly, who can make decisions that are based in the law and that are fair, and can restore that public trust and confidence that I talked about. So I'm really excited to become our next Superior Court judge. Um, I'm excited to take the bench in January. Very good. With the votes of, of people in this county. Very good, excellent, excellent. Do you two have anything that you uh, brought up that you'd like to discuss? We've got a couple minutes. Um, just real quick, um, we brought a lot of good stuff up, but uh, between the two of you, do you have any, uh, it sounds like you don't, but um, uh, d have you thought of anything that brought up a, a, qu a quick question from each of you to the other? Well, I, I'd actually just like to add that, you know, this is the first time I've campaigned for anything. I know Greg's oh, campaigned right. for a couple of years, but I'm sure you agree with me that what's really amazing about doing a campaign like this is getting to meet people. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't know each other but for this. And there's, I've met so many amazing people along the way, okay. whether it's candidates running for other offices or just people in all parts of the county. So sure. um, I just encourage anybody who's thinking about running to just do it. It's really an incredible experience and awesome. you get to meet your community. Okay. Right. I, I'd much rather have a contested, uh, an election than nobody running against, uh, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's good. Uh, people... Uh, you can't really lose. You might not win by the amount of votes, but you never lose when you're able to go out and tell people what you believe and what you stand for. Excellent. And you have a forum when you're running for office. Excellent. Good. Well, you know, again, uh, I'm always so impressed with, uh, you know, uh, people that are so engaged in the community, such as both of you, uh, have given your lives, uh, uh, literally your lives, uh, and your family's lives. And each of you have families, and each yeah. of you have kids, and you have a spouse, and uh, to, to so be so richly blessed. And I use that uh, verbiage because I mean it from the bottom of my heart to have both of you do what you want to do is to serve our community. Okay. So thank you so much for everything that you've done, and I wish the best of luck for each of you. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Boy, that did go by fast, yeah, huh? I'm ready to go. Can we do another hour? Yeah, but they still, they still film a little bit. I know. Kinda, so I good. forgot to thank my husband. <laughs> At least you right. didn't thank your wife.